Well, good evening and welcome once again to our service of worship here at Ladyfield Evangelical Church in Chippenham. We welcome you all warmly here. May the Lord bless us together again uh, today. Uh, we welcome those who may be joining us online as well. Just one or two um, notices just before we start. First of all, to welcome Basil once again. Basil comes from Kerry Baptist in Reading and we look forward to hearing God's word again. Meetings for the week, uh, Monday afternoon, 2.30, the Ladies' Fellowship meet. Uh, this Thursday is prayer meeting at 7.30, and cafe meet on Saturday, 10 till 12, uh, Cafe 316 in the area there. We expect Derek Cleave next Sunday morning, and in the evening will be a, a communion service, a service based around communion, and Steve West will be leading that. A reminder of the coach that we have going uh, to ICC Newport. This is this coming Saturday, um, the God Loves You Tour, where Franklin Graham is preaching down in Newport. Um, so please sign up if you wish to go um, on that. I know there's a good number of names there now, but to be good to make the best use of that occasion that we can, as well as pray concerning it. Um, I think that's probably all I need to say, except to... Over to you, Basil. Thank you so much. Well, good evening. It's be good to be with you again this evening. <clears throat> and good to be here at Ladyville all day of the day. I've enjoyed my day here. We're going to sing number 200. Great is thy faithfulness, O God my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Number 200.
We come now to prayer. We've been asked to pray this evening for a Chris and Tammy Lovell. They have children to look after, and apparently Chris has lost his job. I don't know this family, but some of you do. So let's pray in our prayer time for Chris and Tammy Lovell. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this great privilege we have as your children of being allowed to come to you and speak with you in prayer. We recognize, O oh God, that once upon a time we were far away from you. And because of our sin, we could not approach you even. But we thank you that when the Lord Jesus Christ died upon the cross of Calvary, he dealt with our sin and removed this great barrier which was between us and your holy self. And now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we can approach you and approach you boldly, knowing that you promise to hear the prayers of your children. Fathers, we come to you this evening, we remind ourselves that you are a mighty, eternal, everlasting God, the Lord of all the universe, the creator of the whole universe. And even in this chaotic world, which has been badly affected by sin, you are still in ultimate control. And we thank you for that. We thank you not only for your might and power, but we thank you that you're holy and just. So often in this world, we see sinful things that seem to go unpunished. And we see awful things happening by unjust and evil people. But Father, we know that that's not the final word. One day there'll be a day of great judgment. And the Lord Jesus Christ, your beloved Son, will judge the whole world. The Bible says we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And we know that on that great day, that awesome day, all wrongs will be righted and all injustices will be dealt with. And Father, we thank you that then you'll establish your new and everlasting kingdom, new heavens and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. And Father, we thank you that through the Lord Jesus Christ, we have this wonderful hope that we shall dwell in that wonderful kingdom. Father, we don't deserve that, but we thank you that when we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, we're given this wonderful hope of eternal life in your glorious presence. Father, we thank you also that you're a God of great love, a God of great mercy. You so love this world that you sent your one and only Son to die upon the cross to bear the punishment due to sinners like us. We thank you that in your great love, you watch over us day by day. You care for us and provide for us and guide us and lead us. And Father, we commit this new week into your hands. We do not know what will come our way tomorrow or the next day. We do not know what challenges we will face. But we pray, Father, that in every situation we may honor you and glorify you and that you'll guide us and lead us in times of perplexity, and that you'll strengthen us in times of weakness, that you'll comfort us in times of sadness. And Father, we pray that you'll help us during the days of this coming week to please you in everything that we do and say. Father, we pray in particular for Chris and Tammy Lovell and their family. Uh, we pray that you'll provide for them at this difficult time when Chris has lost his job. We pray that they may know your presence with them and your protection and care. And Father, we pray that at this time of great difficulty in their lives, they may know your help. Father, thank you that we have a concern for others, that when you dealt with our sin, you delivered us from this awful selfishness 
which just live for self. And Father, we thank you for the concern you give us for other people, especially those in great need. Father, we pray again today for the situation in Ukraine. We pray, Father, that you will overrule in that situation. We pray that you'll deal with President Putin. Father, you've dealt with dictators in the past. Some dictators you've wonderfully saved and converted so that they've come to see you and fear you as the living God. And you're able to do that even in this impossible situation. Other dictators, you totally remove from the scene. Lord, everything's under your control. We pray that you'll deal with the situation in a way which will honor you and help your people and deal with tyrants. We pray for your people in Ukraine, for those who've lost loved ones, for those who've seen their homes destroyed. We pray for those who've had to flee to surrounding nations. We thank you for the welcome that they've received by people in Hungary or Romania or Poland or other countries. Thank you that some refugees are being welcomed into this country. And we pray, Father, that the welcome will be genuine. We pray that you'll deal with this dreadful situation in a way which will bring honor to your name. We would also pray for other parts of the world where there is great trouble. We think of Myanmar, where Christians going to church on the Lord's Day run the great risk of being shot and killed. We know that a number of Christians have already perished in that terrible turmoil in Myanmar. Thank you that there are many people there who love the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you that you're protecting them just now. And we pray that you'll bring a better and a more just regime to that country. We also pray for the country of Sri Lanka where there is great trouble and unrest and economic chaos. We know that your people in Sri Lanka are persecuted in a dreadful way. We pray especially for the Tamil people, Tamil-speaking people in the north of Sri Lanka. Those who are persecuted because they're Tamils, those who are persecuted additionally because they're Christians. Lord, watch over them and care for them, we pray. And now we commit ourselves to you. Pray that you'll help us during the days of this coming week to deal with every situation that comes upon us, that we may honor you in everything that we do. And Father, we pray that you'll bless the church here at Ladyfield. Thank you for the way that you've blessed this church in the past. We pray that you'll bless this church continually in the days to come. That many people may come into this building and hear the gospel and be gloriously saved. We ask all of this with the forgiveness of all our sin and with our thanks for the Lord Jesus Christ, our Saviour, who died upon the cross to deal with our sin. All of this we ask in his name. Amen. We'll sing number 1008, The Lord's My Shepherd, I'll Not Want. Then after this hymn, Tim will read to us from the scriptures.
Well, this evening's reading is from the book of Hebrews and chapter 1. And we're just going to dip over into chapter 2, the first four verses of chapter 2 as well. So if you are following or want to follow in one of the blue church Bibles, uh, that's page 848. 848, Hebrews chapter 1. Or you might want to follow on the screen behind. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets. At many times and in various ways... But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he made the universe. The Son is the exact, is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have become your father. Or again, I will be his father and he will be my son. And again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. In speaking of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds, his servants flames of fire. But about the Son, he says, your throne, O God, will last forever and ever, and righteousness will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. He also says, in the beginning, O Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will roll them up like a robe, like a garment they will be changed, but you remain the same, and your years will never end. To which of the angels did God ever say, sit at my right hand? until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? We must pay more careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away. For if the message spoken by angels was binding and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? This salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also testified to it by signs, wonders and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. And our reading ends there. We thank God for his holy and infallible word. The older I get, the more frequently I sing our next hymn to myself. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene, and wonder how he could love me, a sinner, condemned, unclean. We'll sing that hymn, 296.
We're going to look together at that passage we read together from Hebrews 1 and 2, but especially chapter 2, verse 3, where the writer says, How shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? To to ignore and neglect something is very bad indeed. Some people ignore all the gardening programs on television and neglect their gardens until they're overrun with weeds. Others ignore the advice in the handbook that came from their car and neglect their cars until the car breaks down on a cold winter's night. Then you read of court cases in the paper where some awful person has ignored and neglected an animal. And so you see this picture of a poor, emaciated horse. People are horrified by that. Even worse, there are some men who get married and have children and then ignore and neglect their wives, their children, and that is tragic. Some people neglect their health. A man like John Calvin, great theologian, neglected his health and eventually died of a complication of about 21 diseases. There's something, in a sense, noble about neglecting your health for the sake of the gospel. It's not right, but it's something noble about it. But for a man to neglect his family and ignore them, that is terrible indeed. But there's one kind of neglect which is even more, even worse than that, and that is extremely dangerous. The worst kind of neglect is when any man or woman uh, neglects, ignores the news about salvation. It says the writer here, how shall we escape? if we ignore such a great salvation. There are two main ways in which men and women can ignore this salvation which is offered to us in the gospel. One way is just to ignore it completely, never think about it, they never show any interest in it, never show any eagerness to hear it, never have shown any interest in the gospel, They ignore it completely and have done all their lives. Many, men and women all around us live in that position where they totally ignore the Christian message of salvation. They've never bothered about it. They have no intention of bothering about it. They completely ignore it. And that is tragic. And there are some people even in church life who ignore the gospel, who ignore the way of salvation. They hear it week after week, but never bother about it. Sadly, there are some so-called churches which ignore this great salvation. Roger Carswell tells us that he was booked last Christmas by some NHS staff to preach at their gospel service, their carol service, which was held to be held in a local church. And the publicity went out, and Roger agreed to preach. But when one of the church officials, the rector or someone, put a stop to it, and he actually said, I do not want the gospel preached in my church. Can you imagine a clergyman saying that? But he said that, I don't want the gospel preached in my church. That's to ignore the gospel, even by people who are religious. But there's another way of ignoring and neglecting the way of salvation, and that is the danger of which the epistle of Hebrews speaks. There were people, Christians among them, who had embraced the way of salvation. They'd embraced the gospel, professed to believe it, But then because of persecution, because of the appalling treatment they were getting, they had turned their backs on the way of salvation or in danger of doing that. And so they were ignoring it 
as kind of backsliders. Well, that's a tragic thing to do. This way of salvation, which has been purchased by the Lord Jesus Christ, to ignore it either completely or to turn our backs upon it, that is tragic indeed. Because it is such a great salvation. Such a great salvation. What I want to do this evening is to show you just how great this salvation is and just how awful it is to ignore it and neglect it. Are you a Christian? I want to show you that the salvation you have is the greatest thing in the whole world, greater than anything else. If you are someone who's drifting away from the Lord Jesus Christ, I want to show you that what you're doing is tragic indeed. You're turning your back on something that is glorious. And if you're here this evening and you've never believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, I want to show you that you're neglecting something wonderful and something great. One way of grasping, one way of gauging the greatness of the salvation is to look at the plight from which we're saved. The calamity from which we're saved. You look at the burnt out shell of a house from which a family escaped and you say they had a remarkable escape. Just about a year ago, driving up the M4, Mark and I were involved in the dreadful collision when someone uh, drove into us and rammed us into the, the crash barrier. And uh, the next day I went to collect the belongings out of our wrecked car. And I said to myself, my word, God was good. We got out of that alive. You re realize the greatness of the salvation, the greatness of the escape by the peril from which you have escaped. And that is true of this way of salvation. It is so great because of what we've been saved from. We've been saved from the guilt of sin. Before we became Christians, we were guilty and defiled in the sight of God. We were guilty of breaking his laws. We were guilty of rebellion against our maker. We were guilty of defying the Lord of the universe instead of loving God and living for God. We ignored him. And we've been saved from the guilt of sin. All that guilt has been washed away. We've also been saved from the bondage of sin. One of the terrible things about sin is that it not only renders us guilty in the eyes of God, it enslaves us and masters us. We try to shake ourselves free of bad things. <clears throat> I remember in my non-Christian days, making a resolution that I would, a, would live a better life, that I'd give up drinking too much, give up swearing and cursing, giving up this and that and the other. I made a resolution to do so, but I broke the resolution within a day because sin has us in bondage. We're enslaved to sin. But if we're Christians, we've been saved from the slavery sin. Je joy fills my soul, for Jesus has saved me, freed me from sin that long had enslaved me. <clears throat> <clears throat> and if you're not a Christian, you're still in bondage to sin. It's still got you as its slave. But most of all, we've been saved from the punishment of sin from everlasting punishment in hell. That's where we were heading. Because of our sin and rebellion against God, we were going headlong to an eternity in hell. That's the worst thing about sin. It not only, not only, not only makes a man or woman guilty, it not only enslaves, it condemns us to a lost eternity. But as Christians, 
we've been saved from that, this great peril. Now, that's one way of seeing how great the salvation is. Think of what you've been saved from. Those people saved from that burning house. That couple saved from that wrecked car. What a miraculous escape. Men and women saved from the guilt and bondage and punishment of hell. What a great deliverance. So great salvation. Another way of gauging the greatness of the salvation is to think of the position to which we have been saved. Let me illustrate what I mean by that. If you've read the story of John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist Church, you remember that as a child of five years of age, he was saved from the blazing rectory at Epworth, terrible fire there, and uh, someone got a ladder and went up and snatched him through an open window, saved from that blazing house to become one of the greatest preachers of the 18th century and the founder of Methodist churches. Saved from an awful peril, but saved to a wonderful position. Something very similar ha happened to Dr. Lord Jones as a young boy down in South Wales at the house there where he was, he caught fire, and he was thrown from an upstairs window into the arms of people down below. Saved from a terrible peril to become a Harley Street specialist and then to become one of the greatest preachers of the 20th century. You gauge how great the salvation is by thinking of what it's become. <clears throat> Way back in about 1942-43, my first memory is of being in the house when Brahms dropped and my mother couldn't get me and my brother into the air raid shelter in time, so we got under the dining room table. And I remember the front door being blown in and the back door being blown in and so forth. But up the road, 200 yards up the road, many people were killed, houses were demolished. But the air raid wardens went to one house and they dug away and from the wreckage, they rescued a mother and her young, young daughter. And that young daughter has been my wife for the last almost 58 years. Saved, saved from terrible ruin to become my wife. And that's a great, great privilege for me. I'm not sure how great a privilege Margaret regards that, but uh, <laughs> I certainly regard that as a wonderful thing, saved to become my darling wife. As Christians, we've been saved from a terrible peril to become the children of God. The children of God. Behold what manner of love of the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the children of God. Saved from terrible peril to be heirs of eternal glory. Saved from terrible peril to be allowed to serve God in this world. What a great salvation. You gauge something of the wonder of that by thinking what you've been saved to become. Another way of gauging how great the salvation is if we think of the planning behind it, the planning that went into it. Can you remember that time in 1976, July 76, when the Israelis rescued those 106 hostages from Entebbe Airport in Uganda? A plane carrying a number of Israelis had been hijacked and they were being held hostages in Entebbe in Uganda. And the Israelis suddenly snatched all of these hostages out of danger 
into safety. That took immense planning. The planning went on for many days, three weeks, I think. But it was all accomplished in no time at all. Just 90 minutes, all those hostages have been rescued from Entebbe Airport. But the planning of it was immense. Well, that is even more true of our salvation. The Bible tells us that our salvation was planned before the foundation of the world, before we were born, before the world was created. God the Father and his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, planned our salvation. God the Father said, I want to save men and women. And the Lord Jesus Christ agreed with him that the only way to do that was for someone to bear the punishment of their sin in their place. Way back in eternity, the Lord Jesus Christ planned to come into this world to die upon the cross. The planning. If you're a Christian here this evening, the planning of your salvation began long before you were born. It began even before the world was created. God set his eye upon you and planned your... Isn't that amazing? Isn't that astounding? The planning that went into it. And if you become a Christian this evening, if you read the Bible, you will discover that what happens this evening, you being saved, was all planned for way back in eternity. Then a fourth way of discovering, grasping something of the greatness of the salvation is to think of the person who actually saved us. If you were rescued from a blazing house by an ordinary mortal, that would be wonderful. But imagine you were in a blazing house and you were rescued. Well, Prince William was passing by at that time. And Prince William, a future king, risked his life to rescue you from that blazing building. You would talk about that forevermore, wouldn't you? The so prince, the prince risked his life to save me, the person who did it. But think of the person, my friend, who saved you if you were a Christian. He's described in chapter 1 of this remarkable letter. He's the son of God, verse 2. He is equal with God the Father in every way. He's the brightness of his Father's glory. He's the express image of his person. He's far greater than all the angels. That's the message of chapter 1. According to chapter 1, verse 6, he's worshipped by the angels. He's the one who shared with God in the creation of the universe. Verse 10, you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens or the work of your hands. He rules over the whole universe. He's the Lord of lords and King of kings. That's the one who saved us, the Lord of glory. Not a mere man, not the Pope, not Buddha, not Confucius, not one of the millions of Hindu gods. The person who saved us was the Lord of glory the Lord Jesus Christ. What an amazing thing. What an astounding thing. So great a salvation, the person who actually saved us. At the first ever Christian conference I went to with the girl who was about to be my wife, someone sang a solo. Never forgotten it. First time I'd ever heard it. Went like this, down from his glory, ever living story. My God and Savior came, and Jesus was his name. 
Born in a manger to his own a stranger, stooping to win, to woe, to set me free. Oh, how I love him. Oh, how I adore him. My breath, my sunshine, my all in all. The great creator became my savior and all God's fullness dwelleth in him. The person who saved us. Why is it that men and women refuse this wonderful salvation? Why is it that men and women neglect their salvation? They'll do anything to get a bit of news about an earthly prince. As I say, if Prince, Will prince uh, William had saved them, they'd talk about it forever more. But the Lord of glory... The Lord of glory is willing to save them and they don't want to know. Following on from that, <clears throat> the best way of grasping the greatness of the salvation is to think of the price that was paid, what it cost, what it involved in the way of sacrifice and effort and cost on the part of the Lord. That's the thing that strikes you, isn't it? about some rescue attempts, the cost, the sacrifice involved. There's a terrible disaster, like that disaster, that calamity at Aber Aberfan in 1966, when the coal tip slipped and buried a school. Men and women and many boys and girls were trapped and a great rescue attempt was made, and it cost thousands upon thousands of pounds. And it involved firemen and rescue workers with hours and hours and hours of labor, risking their lives. But eventually, a few were saved. Some children were dug out. The cost involved in all of that, in terms of money, in terms of human effort. And it's the same in the spiritual realm. Do you want to see how great the salvation is? Think of the cost involved. Not pound, shilling and pence, but the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ had to leave the glory and splendor of heaven. He had to leave the throne. He became a man. Didn't cease to be the Son of God, but he became a man. He was born in a stable in Bethlehem, laid in a manger. He was mocked. He was ridiculed. He was derided. Then at the age of 33, he went to the cross, shed his blood, and bore the punishment of sin in our place. It all puts all well in verse 9 of the second chapter. Jesus was made a little lower than the angels. What about that? He who created the angels was made a little lower than the angels. He who was worshipped by the angels was made a little lower than them. That he by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. The cost involved. My dear friend, if you become a Christian this evening, it won't cost you a penny. It won't cost you anything. But it's not cheap. It costs the Lord Jesus Christ an enormous amount to save you. Indeed, we're told this in 1 Peter. We are redeemed not with corruptible things, not with cheap things like silver and gold. We are redeemed by the precious blood of Christ. He shed his blood on the cross, died for us in order to secure 
the salvation for us. Think of the cost involved. Then, think of something else to gauge the cost, the greatness of the salvation. The Lord who purchased this salvation for us has ordained that it should be preached throughout the whole world. It's as great as that. The message of salvation is something that God has ordained to preach throughout the whole of the world. Our Lord Jesus Christ began this proclamation himself while he was here on earth. Verse 3 here says, It was declared at first by the Lord, and it's mentioned many times in the Gospel. Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he's anointed me to preach the Gospel. And then when Jesus was about to go back to heaven, he said to his disciples, Go into all the world and preach the Gospel to all creation. So this message of salvation is something which God has ordained should be preached to every nation in the whole world. You see, a great it is. Not something small. Some people refer to Christianity as a Western religion or an English religion. But it's not. At the very beginning, way back in Israel, Jesus himself said, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to all creation. It's for every man and woman. Mark 13, verse 10 says to us that before the Lord Jesus Christ, the end of the world comes, the gospel of salvation must be preached, must be preached to all nations. Thank God that in this chapel, It is preached regularly. The Lord has commanded that that should be done. That's how great the salvation is. It's a worldwide message. Not something cheap on the side in England. It's a worldwide message. So that's how great this message is. Think of the peril from which we've been saved. Think of the position to which we've been saved. Think of the cost involved in the salvation. Think of the worldwide nature of the salvation. And then to top it all, we'll see the greatness of the salvation when we remember it is totally undeserved. We do not deserve to be saved. If you think that somehow or another you deserve to be saved, you deserve to go to heaven. My friend, you've never even begun to understand the Christian message. None of us deserves to be saved. None of us merits a place in heaven. Let me put it like this. If you were trapped in a burning house and in great danger, and someone for whom you've done many good turns came and rescued you, that would be very, very kind, very, very brave. But in some sense, you deserve that. You've done them many favors in the past. But if you were in a burning house, and someone you had abused, and someone you had sworn at, and someone you had cursed, someone you had ignored, came along and rescued you. That would be an amazing act of mercy and grace. You didn't deserve that. And salvation is like that. We don't deserve it. We've ignored God. Sometimes many of us have cursed God, used his name as an oath and a swear word, have cursed the Lord Jesus Christ, used his name in a careless way. None of us deserve to be saved. But we have been saved. It's totally a merit. 
We're going to sing in a moment. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Or another hymn puts it like this, Oh, how the grace of God amazes me. The first hymn, Amazing Grace, was written by a man, seafaring man, who became part of the slave trade, but he was wonderfully, wonderfully saved. Amazing grace that saved a wretch like me. The second one, oh, How the Grace of God Amazes Me, was written by a poor farm laborer in Burundi who became a pastor. Oh, how the grace of God amazes me. And it is amazing. The longer I live, the more I'm amazed and thrilled that God ever saved me. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. My friend, think of the peril from which we're saved, guilt and bondage and hell. Think of the position to which you're saved, to be children of God and servants of God. Think of the planning behind it, plan from before the world began. Think of the person who saves you, the King of glory. Think of the price of the salvation, his precious blood. Can I ask you, my friend, are you neglecting, are you ignoring the salvation in any way? Will you go out of this church building tonight and not think about it again until perhaps you come next week? Or not think about it again at all in your life? That's ignoring, that's ignoring this wonderful salvation. Are you a Christian going through a hard time? Are you thinking of turning your back on this Christian gospel? That will be ignoring this wonderful salvation. God forbid that any of us should do that. We're going to sing this hymn. Number 31. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved the wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. the grace of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ and the love of God our Heavenly Father 
and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all throughout this week and forevermore. Amen.